Haworth today is known for the quaintness of its village street and because the Bronte sisters lived there in the 19th century. Almost the only home they knew was the parsonage as from their earliest days their father was vicar of Haworth. Reverend Patrick Bronte probably came to Haworth because he liked the idea of following in the steps of this man, William Grimshaw, who had been curate of Haworth half a century before and who had achieved great fame. Grimshaw was born in Brindle near Preston in 1708. Little is known of his early life except that he was educated at Christ College, Cambridge. In 1731 he was ordained and in the same year became curate of Todmorden, about 12 miles from Haworth. Grimshaw was at this time a typical parson of his day, spending most of his time in hunting, fishing, cards and merrymaking. His first wife Sarah had lived at Eward Hall near Mythamroyd. Her loss four years after his marriage grieved him much and it is at this time we find a more serious note entering his manner of life. Whilst at Todmorden he read Owen on justification and Brooks's precious remedies against Satan's devices which were a great help to him. By the time Grimshaw came to Haworth he had trusted Jesus Christ as his Saviour and Lord and was a transformed man. This trust in Christ was the key to the new life he now had, charged with meaning and power. He said that if God had drawn up his Bible into heaven and sent him down another, it could not have been newer to him. So fresh and real did God's word become to him after his conversion. His preaching met with speedy and great success, so great that the church was not big enough and the congregation often overflowed into the churchyard. He began a series of meetings throughout his parish, in cottage, barn or field, and often preached thirty times in a week. The Wesleys and Whitfield sometimes preach for him to great crowds. This was his pulpit, now at Stanbury, and this is typical of his preaching. We find pardon, peace and plenteous redemption, and at last rejoice in the common and glorious salvation of his saints. It is well for you who neither truly desire to be in Christ, nor to go to God. It is well for you now that you are not in hell. It is well your day of grace is not utterly past. Behold, now is your accepted time. Behold, now is your day of salvation. Now is faith to be had, saving faith. Now you may be washed from all your sins in the Redeemer's blood. And if you die as you are, out of Christ, void of true faith, unregenerate, unsanctified, fire and brimstone, storm and tempest, God will reign upon you as your eternal, intolerable portion to drink. William Grimshaw, anxious that people should hear the gospel, would sometimes leave the church during the psalm before the sermon and round up those who did not attend church in the village and drive them back to hear the sermon. A common sight on Sunday mornings was to see men jumping from the inn windows saying, the parsons are coming. People asked him to preach in other places too and so he did but met with some persecution. At Cone, the Reverend George White, a ne'er-do-well, incited a mob against him and John Wesley, and they were beaten, dragged in the mire, pelted with mud and stones, and driven away. Because the congregation had multiplied one hundredfold during Grimshaw's time in Haworth, new flagons had to be consecrated to hold the wine needed for communion services so great was the demand and his humility and love were as great as his success when a friend stayed with him he gave up his bedroom and slept in the hayloft and then cleaned his visitors boots early in the morning in 1763 
a fever raged in Howarth, no doubt because the water supply came through the churchyard. Grimshaw's house, Soden's, had its own water supply, but he caught the fever whilst visiting one of his parishioners. He died as a result and was buried at Luddenden Church. His last words were, Here goes an unprofitable servant. It was at Thornton, at nearby Bradford, that the Bronte children were born in this house. Patrick Bronte came from Thornton to Howarth in 1820. The only home most of the children could remember had a grim, forbidding appearance, and the reminders of death were always at hand. Their father maintained an aloofness from his parishioners. He was grave and quiet, and took solitary walks on the moors above the village, and the children adopted similar habits. As their mother had died shortly after their arrival at Howarth, an aunt, Miss Elizabeth Branwell, came from Penzance to help bring them up. The text on her teapot reveals Miss Branwell's dedication to Christ. The eldest two children, Maria and Elizabeth, had some education at a school in Cowan Bridge, near Kirby Lonsdale. Charlotte and Emily spent some time there too, but conditions were so vile that the two eldest sisters died as a result. Charlotte and Emily were then removed. The school is depicted as Lowood in Jane Eyre. At night in the kitchen, Branwell and his three remaining sisters, Charlotte, Emily and Anne, drew up imaginary plots, wrote and discussed plays, and published their own magazine, exclusively for their own entertainment. Charlotte was eventually sent away to school again, this time to Rowhead near Murfield. Emily went there for three months, but pined for Howarth and the Moors, and Anne replaced her there. The nearby Oakwell Hall features in Shirley. When home together, they would walk over the moors to what are now called the Bronte Waterfalls and the Bronte Bridge. Further on is Top Withens, a lonely farmhouse of the moors, the original on which Emily modelled Wuthering Heights. It provides an apt setting for the stormy scenes of her wild book. During this period, Charlotte felt responsible for the education and welfare of the others. They had many discussions as how to earn a sufficient income to meet their modest needs, and yet stay at home to look after their aging father. And for a short time, Charlotte opened her own school at Howarth. The background noise of an early printing press reminds us of the first publishing venture of the sisters, a collection of poems for which they took the pen name of Curra, Ellis and Acton Bell. It sold two copies. Wuthering Heights by Emily and Agnes Grey by Anne were now accepted for publication. Charlotte's The Professor was rejected. While they were in course of production, Charlotte's second novel, Jane Eyre, was published and created a ferment of excitement in the literary world. Eventually, Charlotte and Anne visited London to prove their identity of the so-called Brothers Bell to the publishers, whose office was in Paternoster Row. Their father, meanwhile, had developed cataracts on his eyes, which necessitated an operation in Manchester. But this was only partially successful. In July 1845, Branwell was involved in some scandal and returned home. His last years were ruined by drunkenness and opium-taking and left a marked impression on the disappointed sisters. His favourite haunt was the Black Bull. In September 1848, he died at the age of 31. It was on this couch that Emily died three months later. She herself was only 30 and had suffered for many years refusing 
medical attention to the end. Her savage dog, Keeper, following her death, sat at her bedroom door and howled pitifully for many days. By now, Anne's health too was deteriorating rapidly. Making an overnight stop in York, where they visited the Minster, they journeyed to Scarborough, which would bring back memories of Anne's many happy days there as a governess. The night before Anne died, according to Charlotte's diary, there was a brilliant sunset. The next day, about 11 a.m., she believed she had not long to live, so a physician was sent for, and her address was made to him with perfect composure. She begged him to say how long she might live, not to fear speaking the truth, for she was not afraid to die. The doctor reluctantly admitted that the angel of death had already arrived and that life was ebbing fast. She clasped her hands and reverently invoked a blessing from on high, first upon her sister and then upon her friend to whom she said, be a sister in my stead. Give Charlotte as much of your company as you can. She thanked each for their kindness and attention. Ere long the restlessness of approaching death appeared and she was borne onto the sofa. On being asked if she were any easier, she looked to her questioner and said, It is not you who can give me ease, but soon all will be well through the merits of our Redeemer. Her faith never failed, and her eyes never dimmed, till about two o'clock. Then she calmly and without a sigh passed from the temporal to the eternal. Thus Charlotte lost her brother and two sisters in nine months, and the loneliness and grief became intense. She resumed her writing and completed Shirley. The character of Emily is depicted in the heroine of the book, and for much of the next five years Charlotte struggled with ill health and grief. Her one joy lay in the books and letters she received from time to time. This portrait was painted on one of her several visits to London. She wrote Villette in this period. In 1854, after much initial opposition from her father, Charlotte married his curate, the Reverend Arthur Bell Nichols. Nine months later, she too died leaving her father now very old and with poor eyesight and her husband as the only inmates of the lonely parsonage. The memory of the Brontes lives on. The moors, bleak and wild, the village grim and sombre, and the ever-present reminders of the clutching hand of death. These form the background to the production of literature now preserved amongst the classics of all times. In sharp contrast to their circumstances is the bright faith of Anne, whose trust in Christ gave her a peace which overcame the fear of death, making it but the doorway to eternal happiness. One of her hymns, entitled Confidence, expresses this trust in Christ, her living Saviour. I am weak and prone to ebb. 
personal relationship with God made all the difference to some of the lives we have been looking at. We too can experience this living reality in our lives if we come to God trusting only in the Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. We hope you've enjoyed this film strip and found something of interest in it. If you would like to know more about how a personal relationship with God is possible, do talk to one of the people showing this sound strip before you leave.